Oh, good morning again. I do like that song. The, the, I, the part about turn your eyes upon Jesus, will, you will hear that in our scripture as well. I think it's a perfect, perfect song for us to, to talk about today or to think about before, before we read the word. We, we don't much like to talk about death. <laughs> death isn't really one of our favorite things. We kind of avoid the topic quite a lot, I think. Uh, we try to find other ways around it. We have plenty of euphemis- euphemisms to not talk about it. And it's, it's not really a generally a polite topic of conversation. You know, you're at a party. These are nice hors d'oeuvres. Tell me, um, how many years left do you think I've got? You know, I'm just wondering if you were to take a guess. You know, I don't know, I don't know if that would be taken very well by someone. That's not normal. We don't want to talk about it that way. And um, we, we avoid, we try to take detours around talking about death. We don't want to have that be a normal thing that we think about. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, maybe this is not the week that I should have come here. Um, but uh, <laughs> deep down, I will tell you, deep down, whatever mental blocks I have to prevent myself from thinking about uh, a true eventuality for me, it is there. I know that it is a part of our future, part of my future. But it is it's an inherently difficult topic. Uh, it's difficult for us I think especially if we have experienced a certain amount of loss in our life and it's a little nearer to us. And I, as I thought about that, I thought it's a problem for us if uh, death is nearer or a more salient idea for us. It's a little closer to our heart because either we don't want to talk about it because it brings back lots of bad feelings or, or and there are times when we want to talk about it and to talk about it in a real way and nobody else wants to go there with us. Uh, Both of those are hard situations. Uh, And the world around us doesn't offer us a lot of help in this area. There's maybe certain platitudes or nice things that they'll say, but it isn't really um, something. They don't offer a lot of comfort for us. Um, They don't get to the heart of our discomfort and fear. Uh, But that's okay. Uh, This might be the one time you're thinking to yourself, I wish that this had been the Sunday where we talk about money, if only. No, but I will tell you, we are not just going to focus on death. We are not, uh, it is not a focus on death today, but I will tell you the scripture that we're going to look at does mention death, and and I thought this is a perfect chance for us to dive into this a little bit. Uh, So, whatever that's worth. Uh, Here's what's amazing about when we come to the Bible. Uh, What happens when we come to Scripture with difficult topics like this, what we find is that the Bible doesn't avoid talking about difficult things. Uh, And it doesn't say, it doesn't uh, breeze past them. But what we see instead is that we get God's wisdom and goodness that enters into our real-life situations, our real-life problems. And when God comes into our life, he transforms it. When God comes into our issues and the big problems in the world, he transforms them. He changes them. He never leaves them the same. If you have started to follow Jesus, you have experienced this as well, that God brings this change in your life. And it isn't just moving the furniture around. Sometimes it's knocking down some walls and pushing some things out and condemning some part of the house of your life. God transforms things. And at the very heart of the Christian message is that God entered into our world and he he encountered death himself. But when he did, when he died, he transformed death, that he conquered it by dying. And that is part of the key elements of the Christian message. And that death is just the first thing in the list of terrible sadnesses that Christ came to undo. That is good news for us. So if you are just joining us, or if you are just joining us again, we have been in the book of Hebrews, and we are studying through that. And um, this, um, if that little toe dip into some serious topic was a little bit too much for you, I do have this. Um, uh, what does, how does Pastor Kurt make his coffee? Do you know? Um, he brews it. That's, um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm here all week. I'll be here all week. <laughs> you didn't finish your joke, but the grounds part is okay. He says that's, that's grounds for termination or something like that. I think that's what he wanted. Yeah, I've been, yeah, it's all, uh, this happens when you're in the daily grind. That's what happens. It's all, uh, uh, please, please. Okay, thank you. 
you can think, I, I was given that joke. That wasn't even my idea, so there you go. Um, last week, we talked about how we as human beings, we can be a little drifty, right? That if we, whatever our attention goes on, we tend to kind of go that direction, that we can drift and we If we don't keep our eyes on Jesus, we will drift. And what we took away from that is we said, hey, let's not pretend that we're not drifty people. Uh, That as a church, we need to work together. That we say, let's together push each other to keep our attention on Jesus. To keep our eyes on Jesus and help each other. Because I know, I feel like I heard somewhere a song that I'm, I'm prone to wander. And Lord, I feel it. That I'm prone to leave the God I love. And that that, that is in me and that we are just kind of drifty people. So we meet together to remind each other so that we can live in this world as, uh, as transformed people. And we keep our eyes on Jesus because the picture that we've been given in the beginning of the book of Hebrews is of this amazing king. Uh, this amazing one who is the son who is greater than the angels. Who has come into the world, and he's the one through whom the world was created, and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and both that image of seating is, tells us that he is done with his work of purifying us. He says, after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, that he's done doing that. There's no more sacrifice needed, but it also is an image of him reigning. He's on his throne. He's the king in charge, and so Everything is in place, and he reigns. So he is this heavenly, there's this heavenly image given to us. But then in this chapter 2 that we're getting into today, we're going to get a picture of him as a man, as a human being, a mortal who is here with us. If you want to grab a Bible, open your Bible app. We're going to be in Hebrews 2. There's a little stack of Bibles in the back. There's a a bookshelf back there that you can grab one. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. There's an index in the front of your Bible if you ever are looking for that as well. The Son, what we're going to learn here is that the Son became human. And he became human to undo all human brokenness and suffering. I think I even, did I make a slide about that? I thought I did, but that's okay. Um, Jeff, if you could click through this while uh, while I read, please. Um, So Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, says this. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that was not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your, pl- your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Lord, we ask you to guide us by your Holy Spirit to teach uh, our hearts today, that we we may see you. Uh, may you help us by your spirit to be transformed by this word and have it get down in us, we pray, because of what Jesus has done. Amen. All right, so the writer starts off by quoting Psalm 8. Uh, and He says, well, it's not about angels, which had been the previous bit about angels. No, it's about 
people. And then he quotes Psalm 8, which is about people. And, and in Psalm 8, it's this uh, consideration the psalmist is looking up at the stars and says, when I see all the stars, God, what, what is mankind that you care about us? The, the universe is so big, why would you care about us? Uh, and um, so, uh, I lost my spot. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? So the, a son of man or a, a person that you would care for them. You made them a little lower than the angels or lower for a little while and crowned them with glory and honor. So, and you put everything under their feet. Uh, during my small group discussion this week, uh, one person said, uh, one observation that they made, they said, when it's, uh, what do we see in verse, uh, verse 8? It says, in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Like, what, what is the, song, what's the person saying? Well, when God said God put everything under their feet, what he meant was, well, everything. Uh, everything is supposed to be under people's jurisdiction, I guess. Uh, but when we look around the world, it doesn't quite look like everything's under control, does it? Although people have done some pretty amazing stuff. Feats of engineering, uh, whether that is uh, flight or dams or whatever else that might be, bridges and transportation networks. Even if you think throughout history, domesticating animals and uh, securing our food supply, uh, legal systems, support networks, even space travel, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but a lot of things still remain outside of our control, right? There are natural disasters, uh, floods and earthquakes and things like that. Um, and everything just seems kind of out of reach. We, we use our amazing technology to do cool things and then that ends up creating new streams of waste in our world. Or maybe we use it for bad things. Uh, in our personal lives, too, we still end up having our peace get marred by tragedy or illness or brokenness and aging death. So Psalm 8, it's interesting. It gives us this portrait of human victory, that humans are supposed to have everything under our, their feet. But you and I, we, I, th I think... If we just look around the world, we're like, yeah, this isn't the way it, it always is. It's not always, I'm not winning always. I'm not always winning. It seems like things are a little broken and defective. I don't know if you've ever ordered something from one of those websites, kind of like wish.com. Um, so uh, it's, if you don't know, there's some, there are lots of websites where you can get stuff that's really cheap. Um, surprisingly cheap. Uh, one time, I don't know, it was a lot of years ago, uh, my wife ordered several different dresses that were really nice off of a website like that. And um, I don't know, they cost like $3 or whatever it was. I don't remember. It's like, yeah, why not? Who cares if it doesn't work? And I think one of them was kind of acceptable, right? The other ones were all like kind of twisted and wrong or whatever. And it was kind of comical, actually, how, how not right they were. And I think that that kind of sums up for a lot of us our experience of life in the world. We're like, I kind of, like our, like our life that we ordered is like we accidentally ordered our life on wish.com, right? We're like, yeah, it's kind of right. It kind of looks like the picture I was given, right? I, I, if I compare it, I go, eh, that's in the, it's kind of an impressionist picture of what I ordered. Um, but, um, but, you know, not everything quite works out. Every, every once in a while, you get a surprise, like, well, that was great. Uh, but other times, it, there's a little bit of disappointment. That's not what I ordered. Uh, and, and for us, when we think about our lives, we say, gosh, there, there's a life that I ordered and that I expect to come to me. And I want it to look like that, but it doesn't always end up looking like that. And so we have this dichotomy in our lives that there's great beauty, wonderful people and experiences, and yet great tragedy and brokenness that happens as well. And we say, this is the world we live in. It's beautiful and terrible, that there are people capable of amazing acts of courage, and yet still also acts of deceit or spite. And Psalm 8 says, we should see everything under people's feet, under our control. But, <laughs> I mean, bro, I don't even have my own life under control, right? Let alone the world. So th there is a problem. But the psalmist says, we don't see it like that. It doesn't look like that. We don't see everything under people's control. But what do we see? It says, but we do see Jesus. But we do see Jesus. Uh, someone asked me this week, they said, well, what difference does that make that we see Jesus? Uh, interesting, I will say, by the way, this is the first time in the book of Hebrews that it uses the word Jesus. Previously, it had been about the Son, all about the Son, and we know who they mean, or the Lord, uh, but we, we knew what the author was meaning, but here is kind of the 
the moment of reveal, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus, who became, he was the son, God's perfect wor- word to us, who became this man, Jesus, in a chaotic and sometimes spiteful world that doesn't always work, in, in the face of our own fears, in the face of our own sufferings at times, uh, when we are confronted by situations that in any way could let us down, what we see, the hope that we have in those circumstances is that we can see Jesus. He's the, the son who became human to make all things right. And uh, we're going to see several different things of w- who he is in this passage. He is the perfect person. He's a pioneer. He's a brother. I didn't do all the P thing. He's a brother. Um, and he's victorious. Perfect person, a pioneer, a brother, and he's victorious. So we'll begin uh, with the perfect person. We see Jesus, perfect person. So Hebrews 1, like I said, it talks about how the, the son is superior to all angels, and later on we're going to get into how he's superior, he's better than Moses, he's, he's better than all these other things, but he is superior. And all this chapter is about how he is a human and a, a perfect, the true human. A- and the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who that is, but the writer of Hebrews and, and the context of that psalm, take it beginning, in the beginning they say, hey, this is about humanity, but then the writer of Hebrews then turns it and says, hey, I'm going to apply this directly to Jesus. So it's about humanity, obviously, and then he applies it just to Jesus. Uh, This eternal son who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now exalted above everyone with honor and glory. We get this picture of Christ as the human. He's the example, model, perfect human. He's, in fact, elsewhere in scripture, it talks about how Jesus is like a second Adam, another who has come in his place. And there are other places where that kind of uh, way of using scripture is true as well. There are other places where uh, people, uh, where scripture talks about Israel and where the New Testament writers end up interpreting and say, he is the true Israel. This is the servant who God called, who did it right. The one who is the true son is Jesus. Uh, for ex- just an example, uh, Hosea 11.1 1 says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. In its original context, obviously meant to talk about the exodus as God's people were brought out of Egypt. But Matthew, uh, the gospel writer Matthew, applies that directly to Jesus. He says, when Christ went to Egypt and come, came back, that was to fulfill that out of Egypt I called my son. So that happens in other places as well. But What we see as we also look at Jesus' life, not only are these big titles applied to him, but I'd like for you to check it out for yourself, that in every interaction with people, this guy, Jesus, uh, he does it right. When we see him interacting with lots and lots of different kinds of people, many different situations, many different kind of levels of his own emotional tiredness uh, or uh, his own fatigue and his own situation, we see him interacting with people in a way that, that challenges but also calls them to something greater and uh, maybe even gives them a value that had never been given to them elsewhere in society. It is the perfect person, and that's what he's saying. This is what humanity is supposed to look like. Uh, if you have never read a biography of Jesus, one of the, uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, I, I would encourage you to do that. Maybe this week to say, hey, listen, I'll, I'm going to listen to one of these. The shortest one is Mark, if that helps you. Um, uh, but uh, you may recognize some stories. that They all have a little different flavor, just like if you and I were to tell a different story about the same person, they would sound a little bit in our own flavor. Uh, but um, you may know a lot of stories in the book of Luke. That, um, but both of those, I, I encourage you to check it out and, and read one of those uh, this week to say, hey, I want to know who this Jesus is. Uh, Jesus is also the pioneer that we follow. That's what we see. Christ is this human pioneer who goes on the path that we are supposed to follow. Um, It says that uh, he is, he was crowned with, in uh, verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect. Uh, This word pioneer is like, he's, 
It's, it's, it's closer maybe something like the founder. He's the first one who went there so that everybody else can benefit from it. Right? The, somebody who founds a city, everyone else is able to go to that place and have some structure. Uh, he's uh, some, in another place later on in Hebrews, that same word is translated author. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Uh, he is the, he's the establisher. He's the one who paved the way. He goes and blazes the way. Uh, one author wrote this. The implication is that if Jesus had not blazed the way, there would have been no salvation. He's not just an example to us, which he is, uh, but his mission was to provide the basis on which salvation could be offered to others. Uh, so he's, um, that, that same word in other Greek texts, uh, in non-religious texts, was used for somebody like the champion uh, when you think about someone like Hercules, who was the champion who went before all the people, a representative, but also the one who paved the way. He did that. He, and, but what's interesting, he says, he was perfected. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought that we believed Jesus was perfect already. Uh, how is it that he gets perfected? What's that all about? And it's specifically about his suffering. Uh, it doesn't mean that there was a problem with him. Uh, that there was some kind of a flaw in his character or something like that. Uh, it means that his suffering in some way made him completed or finalized in his role as our pioneer, as our savior. Uh, because Christ didn't end up suffering for himself. He suffered for others. But his suffering was necessary for us to be able to be saved. And now, it, as, as later on at the bottom of this passage, it says he's now a perfect high priest for us. He can intercede perfectly for us because he was tempted. He suffered. Remember, this book is written to people who are experiencing suffering and difficulty. And he says, this is a perfect person for us. He is now, he's the whole package. He is perfect. He's able to do that. Uh, I think of another song, uh, the song, Fairest Lord Jesus, which says, he is the son of God and son of man. So he's someone who has all the power, and yet he completely also understands us. He's completely human. He went down, he suffered, and went all the way down to death for us. And there's another spot in Scripture that says in Ephesians 1.23, he now fills everything in every way. So he was so high, and he was willing to go all the way to the bottom. And the picture that we can have then from this is that he's the one who fills everything in between. There's nothing that gets missed. He's a perfect high priest for us. He can do it perfectly. It's interesting. I'll, I'll just say it just for us on a personal level. Uh, I, I think some of us, there are things that we experience in our life that we wouldn't have chosen to, uh, but we also, uh, maybe we can end up being a little bit like Christ in this way, that we have experienced some kind of uh, pain or suffering that we get to use in some way to serve others. I don't know if you've had that experience of being able to help somebody else. Uh, maybe you have lost uh, a parent, and then when a friend loses their parent, you're able to walk alongside them in a little more compassion. I think that's a great application for us to say we can be someone. You, went, you were not necessarily a willing pioneer in that area. Maybe you were the first one in your friend group uh, to get married, or maybe you were the first one also to, to lose a loved one. But you, as that pioneer, you get to help others to come along with you and to care for them in that. He's a perfect person. He's a pioneer. Whoops. All right. I, I, I'll let you do that, Jeff. I don't know what that is. So, you know, good thing we applauded you earlier. That's wonderful. You're doing great work. Yeah. Um, that was not his fault. I clicked, for the record. That was my click. Uh, that did that. I also broke the thing a couple of weeks ago, too. That was my fault. So look at, don't let the pastor back there. Um, each their own gift. Uh, we also see Jesus who is our brother. It's an interesting, amazing thing that we see in this passage. In verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy. So God, who's the one who makes people holy, and we who are made holy are of the same family. Crazy. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Uh, so we... God makes us holy, we're made holy. And there's, I, I kind of think that this was thrown in there too. I can't help but think that this was in there to spur some of these believers along. Uh, I, I think we, we've talked about how they are under persecution. Some of them maybe are tempted to kind of drift away a bit. Maybe he's saying, hey, listen, he wasn't ashamed to call you a part of his family. What about you? Are you ashamed 
to call yourself part of his family. I, th- I think there's a little bit of that in there, but he's, he wasn't ashamed to be associated with us. That's the amazing beauty that God isn't just speaking to us from above, but he came to be with us. That even God, this God that we worship, would be so close to us. Ancient Christ, uh, church father named Chrysostom, the guy, the guy must have been an amazing preacher because his name in Greek means golden mouth, okay? Not said of Kurt Chrysostom. Um, um, Chrysostom was said of some of you, that is not the word that your mom said about you. You were potty mouth, yeah. Um, um, Chrysostom, golden mouth, he said about this specific verse, he said, for when he clothed himself with flesh, he clothed himself also with siblings. Isn't that wonderful? When he clothed himself with flesh, he accepted that he was getting siblings. A little like when you, if you are married, uh, then you also married a family with that. Um, Jesus was willing. He said, this is what is part of it. I have a family. Verse 12, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. Uh, What is amazing is that that actually comes from Psalm 22, uh, the part of Psalm 22 that you maybe know a little bit better. The beginning starts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of Christ on the cross. And and the first whole part of Psalm 22 is all about this suffering one who's giving his life. And it's all uh, very easy for us to make connections to Christ on the cross. The second part of that whole psalm Psalm 22 begins with this part. I will declare your name. You did all this stuff, and now I will declare your name. And, and the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, this one who is willing to die for us now is not ashamed. That it, it turns from this terrible image to something glorious, that the one who can sing praises, and we are welcomed into that. God identified with us closely. So closely that he's our brother. We are his siblings. We aren't alone, too, in that. It's helpful for us to remember that God is with us. When we say, we see Jesus, it means whatever we are going through, whatever we are facing, that we get to do that with our sibling and our siblings here. That we get to be, we walk with God. So he's the perfect person, he's the pioneer, he's our brother, and uh, he has overcome. We see Jesus who has overcome. Uh, What the the writer of Hebrews is trying to do in this little bit is he's, he's, in this part, he's connecting the whole, he's glorious and big, and he's also human. Why would God do that? What's the, why and why would God ever do that thing? Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. He said, it's kind of almost backwards. He chose to have flesh and blood because we are human. Well, what did it accomplish? Uh, We, I think we kind of quickly connect Jesus' death and his resurrection as being uh, connected to the word we use a lot of times, salvation. We talk about that. Um, But it might be a little va- a bit of a vague word for you, especially if you're newer to the whole faith thing. Uh, it's probably a little more helpful for us in general when, when we are talking with somebody who hasn't grown up with a Christian faith uh, to talk about being transformed. Uh, that it's probably a little more forward-looking, too. There's a little more inertia to that, I think, to talk about us being transformed. Obviously, salvation is a Bible word. We don't, we don't avoid it. Uh, but, but being saved means that we're transformed people. Uh, and we know that this transformation is connected with Jesus' work on the cross. And uh, the Bible gives us image after image for what happened on the cross. What did Jesus do? And it was enormous. Uh, He purified us. He ransomed us. There's lots and lots of stuff there. But it's interesting is that this chapter of Hebrews gives us a couple of categories that we're not always used to when we talk about being transformed or being saved. Uh, By becoming human, by sharing our humanity, by becoming flesh and blood, it says he breaks the power of the devil. Uh, Verse 14, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is, the devil. So Jesus is able to break this power of death by himself dying. Uh, he, it speaks to the power of his life, that he himself wasn't overcome by it, uh, he, but he was resurrected again because 
he didn't die for himself, like we said. He died on the behalf of other people. The only one, one who had ever did that. The only person whose death didn't end in tragedy. The, the only person who, uh, when they, the only person who was able to die not for themselves or in their own life, but that their death was able to overcome. And what that speaks to me, uh, that if Christ is able to overcome Satan and the power of death, the power of death is at work in so many places in our world. Uh, it's the power of, uh, of corruption. It's the, it's the power of things breaking down. It's the power of things that don't live like they're supposed to. And, and that could be in lots and lots of different areas. And I, when we think about what God is going to do, uh, that this, as Christ came, he ushered in a new creation. We talked about this before, which is sad. That, um, I don't know if we're able to get the thing to work. I actually, maybe it's that slide that keeps breaking it. Um, no, I'm going to the next songs we're singing. Okay, I, I had wanted to show a song, a few, or a, an image a couple weeks ago, and that's when it broke before too. So that image, uh, I'll post it online for you. Uh, but that Christ came and he inaugurated this new creation. And in that new creation, it doesn't, hey, hey, all right, there you go. Well done. Uh, thank you. Uh, so in the old creation, it was there. Uh, and we, previously when we talked about it, we, it was that word of the last days was in there. Uh, we are in that overlap between when Christ came and when he comes again in his judgment. And in between, there's an overlap between old creation and new creation. We experience a bit of the new creation. We feel like God answers our prayers sometimes. Uh, we experience the, the new creation, the hope of that world, but we still live in this time of the old creation where death still affects us. But what's interesting is that the, the writers of the, the New Testament use images where they say death doesn't have to affect us in the same way as before. Now, Paul said, where, O oh death, is your sting? We might die, but there's no more sting in it. Or uh, that we don't have to, um, an, another writer said, we don't have to fear death in the same way, that we don't grieve like other people grieve, right? So this is the power. So we, these problems in society that we experience are not going to be there in the rest of creation. Uh, when we look forward, there, there are no governmental problems in the new creation. There is a good king who does it right. Uh, there are no injustices left in the new creation because there is a just judge who is over all. Nothing is left of that. But we live in this time where we know that there's something more. We don't see everything under our feet. But we know that it's supposed to be like that. Thank you, Jeff. Well done. Thank you. Oops. We'll get to that in a minute. Don't get ahead of myself. Um, and it says, verse 15, And he will free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. I, I, I love that uh, somebody this week told me, they said, boy, that's like our song Chain Breaker that we sing here. That he breaks this power that all those who are held in slavery by their fear of death. That we, we don't need to be afraid anymore. Because we see Jesus. We, he went before us into death. He was that pioneer who went in there and he came back out. He was raised to life. And the hope for us then is that we will be as well. That's amazing. There was a writer in the ninth century, I'll give you a couple of historical ones, named Photius. He says this, Before we feared and tried to avoid death as the supreme and invincible evil, but now we perceive it as a prelude transition into the superior life, and we accept it joyously from those who persecute us for the sake of Christ. Uh, the, this person, Phocius, was thinking about being persecuted for his faith. He says, listen, this isn't something I have to worry about. It used, that's me worrying about it was my old life. I know that if I die, I know who I'm going to see. And I'll just tell you as a pastor, I have heard over the last couple of months some people who have told me, Kurt, I, I'm fine. So yes, I'm not well, and I'm going to die soon. He, uh, one person in particular told me, he said, I know that when I close my eyes, the next time I open them, I will see Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? That we don't have to be afraid. And it's been wonderful to hold hands with people who are not afraid. They say, this, I am, I am ready. I know who I'm going to see. All right, let's bring all this stuff together uh, it, what we have here. At the end of the book of Lord of the Rings, um, one of the main characters named Sam, uh, he sees Gandalf the wizard, and uh, he thought he had died. And, and so Sam says to the wizard, he says, 
So does this mean that all the sad things are coming untrue? Does this mean that all the sad things are coming untrue? I love the book, Lord of the Rings. It's, uh, it's not as overtly Christian, but it was written by a, a, a Christian Catholic author, and he, is, uh, his, he has a sweet Christianity that comes through in it, sweet faith. All the things that were coming untrue. That Christ is victorious over everything. We see Christ victorious. There's this cosmic reordering, because as Christians, we know that in the beginning, things were under people's feet. That humans were put on earth to be these vice regents of God. That God said, yeah, work in the garden. This is given to you. Everything is working correctly the way it's supposed to. You even get to name the animals and you work in harmony with the earth and with each other and you're in connection with God. And that got broken. And that same mistake, I've seen it in my own life over and over again, that I continue to choose other things besides God. And that, the implications for that mean that we have a broken relationship with each other and even with the earth and with God. And so the whole order of the way that creation is supposed to be got broken in the fall. It was so much bigger than just they made a little mistake. There was a disordering of the cosmic order of things. And what we see in the book of Hebrews that's so exciting is that Jesus says that there, he, that his, the writer says that what Jesus did is he became this second Adam who came into creation. And what did he do? He didn't sin. He was the better Adam, that he went and even suffered and died. And in his death and resurrection, everything now gets put under his feet. And not only his, but he's reordering things back so that humans are in him, are set right. The creation itself is being set in its right order. In this new creation, things are put back the way they were supposed to be. And I think we got to think more about the implications for what that is. It, it means that it's much more than just some, it's not just between me and God. There's, uh, salvation is important between me and God, but there's what Christ did was cosmic. It was huge, cosmic reordering. And I hear it in Jesus' own words. He says in John 16, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Why? For I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. What are we going to do about that? Very briefly. Uh, There is a a hymn that says this. We can face uncertain days because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, what? What? All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives. The things in this world can be a bit out of control sometimes and they are not the way they're supposed to be. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus, this one who is victorious, who won. Things are out of control, but he has been victorious. So what are we going to do? Let's ask ourselves a few questions. I wonder, what sadness here do you experience? What, what's something that you experience as a sadness in your life, a, a broken thing that is going to come untrue in the new creation? Maybe you can think about that right now. What is, what is something that is sad right now that is going to come untrue in the new creation because Christ is reordering things? What does it mean for you that you aren't alone too, but that Jesus, your brother, is with you? That this Christ is willing to walk with you in your circumstances in this world and on forever into eternity. And finally, here's a prayer for you. To pray, the, you know, the brokenness in the world isn't just out there. The brokenness in the world is also right here, right? In me. So I can pray, Lord, whatever is in me that causes sadness in others. And that's just kind of one way to talk about my own sin leaking out. I'll just call it sadness, right? What a nice way. I'm making you sad, aren't I? Uh, The the evil in me leaking out, the sin in me leaking out. So whatever in me is is caused sadness to others, transform that, God. Change me, God. We can pray that. But wouldn't it be amazing to be a part of a community that sees the world this way, that we see, hey, I'm humble enough that I know that I'm not perfect, 
that we, I'm around with other people that we are, who are humble enough that know that they're broken. They're praying this thing. God, transform me. I need to be changed. And they have a, an expectation that that is true for, for you and for me uh, who are trying to do that. They're seeing, but they also believe that this isn't the way that things are supposed to be. That we can work toward a world where God is in control and things look like the way that God wants them to. That would be amazing. I, I would like to be a part of a community that's aiming that way working inwardly, working outwardly. Uh, That's the kind of community I want to be a part of. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to transform us. Change our hearts, God. Shape us. You are Lord. And and, and this passage at first first glance is just a little confusing, um, but when we see it in the light of the transformation that you're doing in the cosmos, we pray that this picture of you will get bigger, whether, whether we see that you're that you are a perfect God and you are a perfect human brought together in one person who died for us. I would like, maybe maybe you're not a person who normally prays. I'd love for you to take a moment to ask God, God, the things in me that are broken and cause sadness, transform me, work in me, make me more like you. pray in your name. Amen. One of the ways that we communicate